Today's show is sponsored by Datadog, a cloud-scale monitoring platform that unifies metrics, logs, and traces from technologies like Istio, AppMesh, and Envoy. Plus, Datadog's service map automatically plots out the dependencies in your microservices architectures for seamless, context-rich troubleshooting. With rich visualizations, algorithmic alerting, and more than 250 vendor-supported integrations, Datadog allows you to monitor your distributed applications in real time. Start a free 14-day trial today by visiting datadog.com slash cloudcast, and Datadog will send you a great free t-shirt. That's datadog.com slash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is The Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We're coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, Before we jump into cloud news, uh, just kind of a message to everyone out there. Uh, 2020 is uh, the year that just keeps on giving, and so uh, hopefully everyone is staying safe. Uh, In addition to the pandemic going on, um, we have uh, here in the United States uh, some pretty bad fires in Colorado and uh, pretty bad fires in California as well and so uh, everyone stay safe thoughts and prayers with everyone and then on top of that uh, two hurricanes uh, coming uh, headed towards New Orleans as well so everyone please 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 stay safe say stay safe out there take care of your friends take care of your family and uh, hopefully everyone will get a little bit of a diversion uh, from our news and our episode this week And with that, we'll dive right into our news. Um, Our first article this week is all about Alibaba and Alibaba Cloud. We've covered them periodically here on the show. And what's really interesting here is uh, they continue to grow, Um, just like most of the other uh, quote-unquote big public clouds. um, 59% uh, growth year over year. uh, knocking on $2 billion a quarter in revenue. And the overall business uh, is up 34% from a year ago. But what I really found interesting here was the analysis behind it. Um, they want to be more than just straight up infrastructure. And this is a really smart choice. Uh, you know, as we've seen, as these public clouds grow up, they, they start with the basic infrastructure services, um, but then you that just becomes price competitive because it's really a lowest common denominator. So how can they add things on top of it? So you're starting to see this growth of the portfolio. And along with the growth of this portfolio, of course, more revenue streams to expand into. So um, if you're interested in that, we'll have a link in the show notes for that. And now moving on to our second and third stories all in one. Uh, They're both Amazon. Uh, What's interesting here is the trend behind this. Amazon announced uh, recently they're going to be expanding across the United States. Uh, Over 3,000 jobs in six different cities, uh, New York, Phoenix, San Diego, Denver, Detroit, and Dallas, if I remember correctly. What's interesting is they're putting not just a lot of jobs, but over 1.4 billion into new offices and quite frankly, bucking a trend. Uh, You're seeing a trend of many of the tech companies implementing full work from home, uh, you know, full disclosure, my company, I'm not going to be returning to an office until at least uh, the end of this year. Uh, but they're kind of going the opposite way and doubling down. And so this will be really interesting of the timing of all of this. Are they trying to time all of this and build all of this out uh, right as we come out of the pandemic situation here in the United States? And and really only time will tell on that. And for the third story, this is more rumors and speculation. Amazon is in talks to invest into Rackspace. Uh, Rackspace, of course, longtime friend of the show, uh, of course, very popular back in the OpenStack days, um, kind of fallen out of favor, always known for fanatical customer support, really, really rabid fan base and, and a lot of repeat customers. So there's a lot of really great customers there, but 
I, I think it's no secret that Rackspace kind of fell on hard times, really didn't quite transform enough, might have gone a little too all in on certain technologies and didn't necessarily follow the trends of the other, um, you know, up and coming clouds at the time. And so now looking for um, some additional investment. Uh, time will tell. Uh, what comes out of this? Uh, they are, uh, last time I checked, uh, private equity owned. And and so who knows what will happen with something like that. But it'd be really interesting. Uh, I would love to know, um, you know, why would Amazon do something like that? Um, from a purely specula- speculation standpoint in the industry, Amazon isn't known for doing investments or, or doing partnerships or buying minor, minority stakes like this. And so really interesting trend here. And, and I'll be watching this closely to see where this goes. And for our fourth and final story today, we have IBM. IBM has announced they're going to be investing a billion dollars uh, to go compete with Amazon. Now, uh, for longtime listeners of the show, You'll remember the last time uh, IBM said they put up a billion dollars, right? And this was a couple of years ago uh, before, you know, you really had the big public clouds and everyone wanted to be a big public cloud and Cisco put up a billion and Oracle put up a billion and IBM put up a billion. And in quote Simon, Simon Wardley, who passed guest of the show, that was, you know, that's just a starting point. And that was just a starting point back then. And we never really saw any traction from that billion dollar investment from a lot of these. And we honestly don't even ever know if they they ever went through with it. I never saw anything. Uh, But, you know, my personal opinion, all of this is a billion to compete with Amazon almost seems like a drop in the bucket. This seems like a really, really interesting and very small starting point. Um, you, you, you're going to need a lot more than $1 billion <laughs> to compete with Amazon these days. But it makes sense from a, what does their customer base look like? A lot of long, loyal IBM customers, well, they may be looking to go to cloud. And of course, the acquisition of Red Hat recently, and they have to figure out how to monetize and take their existing customer base and give them some valid options so that they don't lose them longer term. So this makes perfect sense, but I question the amount. You know, for me, it would be more attractive if this was a $10 billion investment, but good start. And uh, we'll see where the announcements go from here. And so with that, that is that wraps cloud news of the week of course links in the show notes if you want to dig in deeper on any of these articles and now on to the main segment today's show is sponsored by divi cloud divi cloud protects cloud and container environments from policy violations threats iam challenges and misconfigurations types of misconfigurations that have cost enterprises a jaw-dropping five trillion dollars over the last two years divi cloud provides continuous security and compliance across all cloud service providers and containers including AWS, GCP, Azure, Alibaba, and Kubernetes, providing a comprehensive view of what's in your cloud, along with the tools and automation you need to manage it today. Divi Cloud is proving that security and innovation are not mutually exclusive, one customer at a time. Join innovative enterprises like Spotify, Fannie Mae, and Discovery, who have found the freedom to innovate securely without loss of control. To learn more, visit divicloud.com forward slash cloudcast. That's D-I-V-V-Y-C-L-O-U-D dot com slash cloudcast to sign up for a free trial. Divi Cloud, find your freedom to innovate. And we're back. Um, Really, really interesting show this week. We have Todd Chris, Senior Solutions Architect at Intel. How are you doing today, Todd? I am doing great. How about yourself? Uh, doing great, doing great. We were just talking about uh, hopefully if everything holds out here, we won't have summer storms or anything else going by and we'll have a, a decent recording session here. Uh, it, it seems like it's that time of the year for, for interruptions. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, um, that's why I'm glad I'm sitting in my office with the air conditioning on and uh, just sitting here smiling, ready to go. Exactly. So you've had a, a broad set of experiences in your career. So how did you come into being focused on cloud and, and, and specifically multi-cloud technologies and solutions? Awesome. Uh, that's a great question. So actually, uh, I've been at Intel. Uh, I just celebrated my 25th year anniversary 
last week. Um, so don't hold that against me. I've been around a while, uh, but I did start out in the, uh, in the IT department. I worked probably about half my career at Intel uh, in IT. Uh, so I was the guy that was out there pushing the buttons, swapping drives, you know, doing all the regular maintenance stuff in the data center. So I've always had kind of the server mentality uh, on the back end. And uh, whenever I had the opportunity, I moved over into our business unit under, um, you know, whether it's our business platforms, whether it was the client side or the server side, uh, I've worked in both areas and eventually ended up into the, into the server management uh, type model. And from there we have, you know, all the telemetry and uh, the focus on the, the cores and virtualization and all that. And it just naturally kind of progresses from, you know, virtualization into cloud and now multi-cloud is just exploding everywhere. So that's kind of my, my short, long story, I guess you could say, uh, over my history here at Intel. No, thanks, Todd. That's really good. And, and today we're going to actually be talking about that multi-cloud and some of the multi-cloud offerings and specifically Anthos, um, from Google cloud. And for those, uh, familiar with the show, you know, we've, we've kind of covered it since the start. Um, uh, you know, full disclosure, uh, Google uh, has been a sponsor of the the podcast in previous years, and, and we've actually attended the events a number of times. And um, a few years ago, I would say that that mentality was the, the cloud providers were just, they were all in on just public cloud. And um, that, that message did receive some, I'll just say mixed results. Uh, and, and what we've seen is this shift in the market that is really now about hybrid and multi-cloud offerings that that really have a broader reach. And so as, as somebody who has seen this firsthand, Todd, give us a little bit of your insights and what you've thought and seen in this shift over the last couple of years. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great perspective that, um, you know, we have seen that happen, uh, you know, even at Intel, right? We had a, a big burst out to public cloud as well. And pretty much, you know, anybody that has been in computing for the past 10 years, they have definitely touched the cloud in, in one way or the other. And I think the, the most pervasive thing that, that made it so easy was that you could simply just swipe a credit card and get to work. You didn't have to call the IT guy. You didn't have to set up all, uh, you know, all your structured stuff and go through all the processes. Um, and I think over that time, uh, as customers have been doing that, they realized they left a lot of gaps and they said, hey, you know what, we haven't really been following the protocol. Uh, we might have been a little uh, loose in some of our formatting and some of our uh, structure. Uh, so they've really kind of had to backtrace a little bit of that, right? Where everything was instantly, let's throw everything out to the public cloud. Now that their software has really caught up between on-premise and off-premise and being able to share content back and forth, uh, it makes it that much easier now. So customers now have choice. And I think that's what Google has really experienced, right? They've seen that burst where everybody jumped into the cloud and they started seeing some stuff come back off of Google Cloud and they sat back and thought, why is that happening? And let's talk to our customers and see what's happening. Um, so basically trying to figure out which workloads land in the cloud and which ones land on-prem in a cloud. Uh, I try to tend to teach people that cloud is no longer just a location. It's more of a function or an architecture. Uh, and it gives you that flexibility, right? That, that I can do work today uh, versus waiting for an infrastructure to be set up. So uh, I think Google's really been paying attention to their customers in that space and being able to take that workload placement mentality and say, hey, you know, simple web services and stuff, they, those can go up on the public cloud. Um, things like secure file shares, uh, maybe some HIPAA-based data, uh, you know, some of that stuff might need to stay on-premise or it might need to stay, um, you know, inside a certain geographic region just because of the, of the laws in the area. Yep. And, and, Let's dig into Anthos specifically, um, because, and I'm really excited for this because I, I really haven't been exposed to the details yet. So, what are let, let, let's start off with a kind of an Anthos 101, right? What are the core elements? What types of services does it deliver? And then I'm going to ask you a twofold one at the end. What's the overall experience, both? as an operations person, uh, since you and I kind of share that background, but also the, the actual end user and customer delivery experience as well. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, um, you know, first and foremost, I think, um, Anthos, uh, GKE on-prem, uh, is what you actually can install on your local platform in your private data center, or you can install it in AWS or Azure, or even in GCP if you want. Um, 
it really gives you container parity with GKE and Google Cloud. So if you're already familiar with containers, you've been using Kubernetes, you've been using Google Cloud, it's a seamless integration with what you see on, on Google Cloud. It's that single pane of glass. Uh, you basically log into Google Cloud and you can see uh, these deployments of Anthos basically wherever you deploy them into. So th the nice thing about uh, Anthos is it gives customers an opportunity to modernize their data center architecture. Um, it utilizes you know, the latest virtualization. Uh, for example, it's built on top of VMware uh, software-defined networking, software-defined storage with vSAN. Uh, it shares that same GKE marketplace. Uh, it has service management, orchestration, config, and policy management, all the stuff that goes into that DevOps mentality uh, that makes things that much easier, right? And like I said before, whenever everybody went to public cloud, it was because it was simple and easy to do. Google Anthos gives that simple and easy to do back to the customer so they can make the decision whether they, would, they want to deploy it in GCP, you know, in GKE up in the public cloud, or if they want to deploy it uh, in any one of their data centers or all of their data centers at once. Nice, nice. And Todd, let's talk a little bit about some of the newer things then, right? Because there was the initial offering, uh, well, uh, even farther back than that, there was the initial announcement. <laughs> and then there was the offering that, that you know, kind of came out in, in limited availability there for a little while. And now we're kind of moving on and, and that that cadence of, of features and capabilities is starting to roll out now. And so what are some of the things that, that have been announced um, and how do they help um, with hybrid and, and multi-cloud, you know, like I'm thinking you know, off the top of my head, like, you know, Anthos Migrate or some of these other things like that. Yeah, definitely. That's that's a great segue into, you know, why customers enjoy the fact of being able to deploy their workloads anywhere. Uh, Google looked at customers' workloads and realized that they have data everywhere, right? It, it might not all be in GCP. It might not all be in Azure, AWS, might not all be on-prem. So they extended this Anthos architecture to stretch across any of these data planes, uh, which is really, really innovative. And it gives the customer choice. Uh, sometimes customers have very large data stores that's very cumbersome to move back and forth. And they're waiting for data to move before they can actually do processing. With Anthos, you can actually deploy that functionality where your data is located. Uh, so whether you have something uh, you know, on-prem in France, and you have to do some compute for something that's going to happen in Seattle. You don't have to transport all that data and wait, you know, a day or so, depending on how much data that you have. You can actually do the work and then just send the, the immediate data that you actually need. Um, and it gives the customers, you know, quicker time to market, essentially. Um, but, you know, some of the newer services, right? I mean, at, Google Anthos came out with, you know, they have their service mesh, they have their config management and cloud run for Anthos. Uh, this gives you all of that, you know, rich developer and operational experience uh, that really optimizes a support model. Uh, so those developers can get in, they can write their code and they can just deploy it, right? Uh, if you've got your template set up properly, uh, you're able to set up your um, your configs properly for Kubernetes. And you know we're doing a demo here in the next couple of weeks uh, with Google and uh, and Redapt is really fun to be able to showcase that if you have uh, a retail store, for example, or you have hundreds of retail stores, you can make one simple change on the back end. Say a developer has to do something for a certain day launch. You can push that content out. You can set up your template and push it out instantly. So that way you don't have to worry about what it, what we used to call sneaker net. You'd run around to each server and you'd upload the, the file and, and all that. Now, obviously, things have progressed quite a bit since then. Uh, but literally with a couple clicks of a button, um, you can have this content deployed and you know that you have parity across all of your sites that you need to have that control over. So it makes it that much easier. Um, one of the other big ones is, uh, you know, migrate for Anthos. That's been a, a really big push forward with customers that want to modernize their data center. They want to get into a Kubernetes infrastructure. They're not really sure how. They might not have all the, all the right, um, you know, coders and developers in place. The nice thing with with migrate for Anthos is that you can actually migrate your workloads, migrate your VMs or entire systems into a Kubernetes uh, container, and you're already modernizing your data center because you've utilized that simple application. So it, it's a really nice uh, model to help build uh, kind of an IT modernization story, not only with, with hardware, 
uh, if you're deploying some new, uh, you know, hyper-converged models, but also with that software is always up to date, always has the latest version of Kubernetes, always has the support there from Google as well. And and migrate reminds me, I'm going to severely date myself here, of the old like physical to virtual conversions and the conversion utilities we used to have oh, to yes. run, right? <laughs> Very painful, um, but yes, we've got many of those hours. <laughs> and, 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 and kind of a follow-up question to all of this. So, so to be clear, Anthos is less about, you know, physical hardware or infrastructure and is more about, um, you know, th- almost like a toolbox of services, correct? Yeah, you can definitely look at it. Um, if, if you're a developer, that's all you really think about is the software. You don't really plan of, hey, I need to have it land on this box or that box. You know, those those days are, are slowly going away. Um, and that's what Intel really helps bring to light is even though the developers might not know exactly what they're deploying on, we need to make sure that the, those consumers essentially uh, have the right tools on the back end to be able to make their code run the best as, as possible. Uh, and that's where Intel really steps up with, you know, not only with Google, but also with VMware for the Anthos deployment right now. Yeah. And I actually, um, I was going to ask you specifically about that of, you know, you've got these applications and, and maybe some of those applications are running in the cloud. Some of them are running uh, on premises, but, but, um, you know, there's different use cases between the both of those. And um, so l- let me let me ask this kind of in a step back to all of that. In your experience and talking to customers, what are some of the reasons why somebody may choose one location or another? And, and to be clear, too, like Anthos runs on AWS and Azure as well. And so what are some of the like in that decision tree criteria for use cases of of choosing the location? And then, you know, kind of a little bit of the follow on. We, we talked about it just real briefly. But how does Intel help Google improve all of that? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So um, some of the reasoning is just like you had said, right? Sometimes customers have data in AWS or Azure already, uh, and moving that data to another location just to run a certain application just might not be feasible, right? It might cost a lot of money. Uh, it, it takes a lot of time. You know, like I said, people don't want to wait for data anymore. They want to just actually start compute. Uh, so that's the nice thing is with Anthos, you can deploy and use the data work no matter where the data is. Uh, so if you've got a requirement or, or a need to have data in a certain area of safe, for like GDPR, Patriot Act, you know, X, Y, Z type of regulation, right? Um, the nice thing is you, you can build a Google Anthos environment to be where your data resides, and it gives you that full uh, breadth of, you know, complexity that you would have if you are on GCP using GKE tools and using the entire marketplace. And Intel really works with, you know, not only our, our partners, you know, the OEMs and ODMs, but also with the end users to help them understand how Intel can help Google um, bring this Anthos service uh, to market. You know, we, we started working with Google Cloud back in uh, it's 2018, so uh, before we, we launched. And we sat down and really figured out what's the best architecture to deploy this on. Uh, Google had already made the decision to say, hey, we're going to utilize VMware because it's kind of the incumbent of the data center, of the enterprise data center. Uh, VMware is everywhere. It's an easy landing zone. So to be able to build that Google Anthos appliance that resides on top of VMware uh, was a simple and easy discussion. The nice thing with that is that Intel already works with VMware um, very stringently. We've got a great team that works with them all the time. And, you know, we bring uh, all of Intel to Intel's breadth into the scope of Anthos, right? It's not just the processors anymore. It's processors, it's persistent memory, it's all flash storage, and it's networking. So we have those four architectural pillars that we can align uh, between you know ourselves, Google, and VMware to really bring a really broad and rich hyper-converged environment to the customer. So not only are they able to deploy and run the tools where their data is located, they know that they're going to have uh, an assured level of performance. They know that all these things are going to work together. They know that Google's going to support it. They know that VMware is going to support it. And they know that their vendor is going to support it, uh, no matter if anything breaks in the future. So we truly try to make this kind of a future-proof model as we build this all together. That's fantastic, Todd. And our audience has a lot of architects out there, a lot of uh, practitioners out there. What are some of the the early use cases that have had 
success with Anthos and, and, and we always love to talk about the flip side of that. What are some early lessons learned, uh, that companies are also finding out with Anthos? Yeah. So I think, you know, a lot of the decisions on, on data placement, like we've talked about, uh, are, are some of the big reasons why end users chose to go with Anthos. Um, and the Anthos scope has grown from just a single point placement for a private data center. Now it's available in public clouds and multi-clouds. It's available in GCP. Uh, they saw that customers really want this, this flexibility. So I think that was really important. Uh, like we had talked about before, the migrate for Anthos is starting to gain a lot more popularity. They're starting to see uh, how easy this can be. Uh, so as they get more familiar with the whole Anthos uh, infrastructure, they're able to do some migrations, able to optimize and uplift some of their uh, development code uh, into a containerized um, effect, essentially, and be able to give them more flexibility from that perspective. Um, and I think, you know, as we move forward, we're going to learn more and more. Uh, but I just I see a lot more uh, functionality and flexibility coming from Google in this space. Uh, obviously, I can't give away all this all the fun secrets, but you know we're we're partnered up with them uh, pretty well. You know, there's a bunch of Anthos ready partners. Uh, Intel is one of them. You know, taking things like our you know our Intel Xeon, uh, our second generation uh, Intel Xeon scalable processors, making sure that we've got the right uh, you know bang for the buck type of setup. Right. Not all customers need to have that platinum SKU. So we designed for that majority of the enterprise. Right. We're taking a gold based SKU, pairing it up with the right amount of memory uh, and making sure that the customer has a rich experience. It's not just from the software, but it's also from that hardware perspective as well. Nice. And, and last question, because we're kind of at time here, Todd, for those that want to get started and, and maybe they've heard about it or maybe, you know, took it, taken a look at a, a couple of the documents or the sites. What, how do you recommend everyone kind of roll up, roll up their sleeves and dig in? Yeah. So that's, that's a great question. So there's uh, Intel select solutions for Google clouds. Anthos is available. You can do a, a, a quick Google search. Ha ha. Um, and you can take a look uh, at our reference design that we have out there. It gives you a, a base configuration of what we would say. This is a kind of a standard where you would start type of configuration. It includes all the versioning of you know, Google Anthos, Kubernetes, VMware, vSAN, the, the, you know, the whole nine yards there. It also has a plus configuration. So it's kind of a what if build. Like if you need more CPU or you need more memory, or you need more storage. Um, you know, we try to make these... Uh, platforms as rich as possible without breaking the bank. So that's a great place to start. Uh, we have lots of links inside of that. Uh, so it's Intel Select Solutions for Google Cloud's Anthos. Uh, we have an update that's coming out uh, probably in the next week or so. Uh, so definitely go check that out. Uh, it's a great place to start. There's tons of uh, information out there to be able to reach out and uh, see all the work that Intel's been doing with Google. Fantastic. And well, Todd, I'll make sure there is a link in the show notes as well. So um, when uh, everyone uh, listens to this, we'll make sure that that is in there. So Todd, thank you very much for your time this week. Really appreciate the conversation. Um, and on behalf of Brian, who wasn't able to make it this week, thank you everyone for listening. And we, we hope to uh, hear from everyone next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 